You know, in the charismatic movement, in the Jesus people movement, when all these hippies started getting saved, and all these kids on campuses started getting saved. One of the things God did was just, he created this holy curiosity. People just started thinking about God. And they heard about this or that. They were disillusioned with many things happening in the nation. And, they, and, and just God, it, several different things were happening that, that, that sort of made a, a generation just really want change. And... Uh, something real they were frustrated with government and politics and their parents and the war in vietnam and they just wanted something different and so they were just ready for something real and when they started hearing about this jesus thing they would literally sit around fires or benches passing joints and in between tokes, what do you think about this Jesus, man? I'm serious. I'm absolutely serious. But what do you think about this Jesus thing? And the Lord started proving himself to them started changing lives. They, they, be, they started believing, becoming born again. And this hippie revival happened. I remember when the, when the hippies started showing up at Bible School of Christ for the Nations. It was like, who are these people? They don't have shoes. Long hair. No protocol. I mean, if the speaker said something that they really liked, they'd just jump up on the front row and go, oh, ooh, ooh, that was so good. <laughs> you'd have to talk to them there and say, you know, just, just kind of hold it, hold your praise and your excitement a little bit. <laughs> but God started showing himself to these people. You know how much some of you do anyway. You know how much I love the story of the man at Gate Beautiful. And what fascinates me about that, and since I know I've talked about this before, I'll just be brief. As far as telling the story, I'll just give you the headlines. So this guy has sat there all of his life since, boy, he's probably been there 30 some years. So he's at a very prominent gate of the temple, so uh, thousands of people walk by him daily and give him a little penny or whatever. But the point is, because of Israel gathering three times a year from all over the, the nation, gathering to Jerusalem for the feasts, and they would go to the temple, uh, then most of, most of those people would see him. And, and so whether they knew him or not, the entire nation knew uh, most of the nation probably knew about this guy. I mean, they probably walked by, some, many of them probably flipped him a penny or two. Jesus walked by him dozens of times, maybe hundreds of times, and didn't heal him. Because God was saving the miracle for the right time. And this is what I didn't know, that the name beautiful doesn't mean pretty or attractive. It means right time. Horeos. It is translated beautiful. It's okay to translate beautiful because that became a true derived meaning of the word, but it's circumstantial beauty. When the right circumstances, people, places, time, all come together in the right way, it creates a beautiful thing. So it's the horeos gate, which means right time. So when you put the symbolism in that symbolism into the story, you realize God named the gate. 
he put the, the person at the, at the right gate so that at the right time he could work a miracle that the entire nation would see and know there is absolutely no way this is fake or phony. I've seen him for 30 some years sitting there. I've given him money just like you have. And I don't pretend to understand all the theology, but that is him running and leaping and praising God. So when Peter gets up and starts preaching, seizing the moment, This was done in the name of the Jesus we're preaching to you. He is alive. He did raise from the dead. He is the Messiah. Whew. Revival. Don't tell me he won't prove things to people. To hungry people that need something to show them that this message is true. Because that college over there, over there, or up there, has been telling them that there are many ways to God. Don't buy into this Christian thing that there's only one way. There's, the Buddhists have, have ways, and, and the Muslims have ways, and the Hindus have ways, and there are many ways to God, and blah, 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 blah. And they've been so indoctrinated, and then maybe they've come from a Jewish home. They've been told all their life, this Messiah, this Jesus Christ is not the Messiah. So these are sincere people that believe these things. And God is not up in heaven saying, you know, well, forget them because, you know, if they don't believe, well, so be it. Or if they don't believe I'm the Messiah, then the, the, well, go get somebody else then. That's not his attitude. His heart is, I want them to know. I love those people. And I'll tell you right now, He's coming after them. He is coming after them. So he's, he's been challenging me to believe more in his mercy. That he would rather give mercy than judgment. That when I see things being done by people that I, I think, you know, some of the things that happen in this country and around the world are just so crazy. I just, you know, I just, I mean, I have said before, I guess it's probably true. If I, man, I don't know how, why God just doesn't have another flood and just start over and say, I changed my mind. I'm going to do another one. Well, I can tell you why he doesn't do that. Number one, he said he wouldn't, but number two, he takes no pleasure in judgment. He takes no pleasure in, judge, in judgment. How do I know? He said so. He takes no pleasure in the judgment of the wicked. So it's not a stretch for God. It's a stretch for us. It's not a stretch for God to send a prophet to a city like Nineveh that has become so evil, so wicked, that as a just and righteous God, he can no longer let this happen. So he says, I'm going to destroy the city. But somehow, I don't know how, we don't even know how. Somehow when the prophet delivered the message, somebody started waking up and repentance started happening. And maybe it was the king. You know, I mean, he was a part of it, obviously. And so maybe he just put the word out and maybe they all started listening and then maybe Holy Spirit jumped in there and said, whoa, oh, lift the veil off of this people. But it was no stretch for God to say what to the angels, whoa, 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 whoa. I know what I said, but you know what I said over here when I said, if I say I'm going to do that and so the people repent, I'll change my mind about what I'm going to do. And and if I say I'm going to bless and they rebel and move into sin, then I'm going to, not going to do the blessing. I'm going to reverse it. So he gave him, he's given himself the, the stated, as though he needs permission, but he, he's told us in Scripture, I will do that. Just because I said it doesn't mean I have to do it. 
I don't mean keeping his word. You know what I mean. I'm talking about judgment. So it was no stretch for him to put the brakes on the judgment and say, I don't have to do this now. I can pour out my spirit to save them. 